I'm going to be a shorter one. This one features author from Forgotten Realms, um, Erin M. Evans, as she is talking about book three of The Sundering, the Forgotten Realms series, which we have done books one and two of um, by Ari Salvatore and Paula Kemp, and now book three. I hope you enjoy this interview as she gives her insights on writing, um, writing book three of The Sundering, known as The Adversary, and her insights and advice on writing, and especially if you want to write for The Forgotten Realms. Enjoy this interview, folks, and stay tuned after for when I give some details about some of the future plans of Bombay Radio, and bid you farewell. And now, the Bombay Radio interview with author Aaron M. Evans about book three of The Forgotten Realms series, The Sundering, The Adversary. The first thing that we should probably do is just have you introduce yourself, who you are, and how you relate to Forgotten Realms, and a little bit about Book 3 of the Sundering, The Adversary. Uh, my name is Erin M. Evans. I am an author for Forgotten Realms. I've written the Brimstone Angel series, uh, which is continuing into the Sundering with Book 3, The Adversary. Uh, in The Adversary, my character, Farida, um, gets pulled into... Uh, conflict uh, between the followers of Shar and, and Netherese Empire and the Nine Hells. Uh, so things get, get pretty hairy pretty fast. So now that we're in book three of the Sundering, we can definitely tell where the, the, the general conflict lies between the followers of Shar and the Netherese and uh, the end of the Spell Plague and, and so on. So we definitely tell the direction that we're heading. There's a, a, there's a through line through this entire series. So I, I guess um, the first question we should ask, we've asked all the authors so far, is how did you get involved in The Sundering, which is basically the Forgotten Realms uh, superstar saga? It's pretty exciting. Um, I, you know, obviously wasn't privy to the discussions going on. Um, they've told me that they really like my work and they felt that of the fourth edition authors, I was one that they felt they, they could put a lot of uh, push behind. And you know, they basically, I got an email out of the blue from James Wyatt that said, we, we want to do this project and we want you to be involved, which was really, it's just quite an honor. Um, it, it's really been an exciting process all around. So, yeah, so then I was involved in the story summits to come up with the concept and the, to kind of hone it and talk about ways that we can, you know, revitalize the realms. So both uh, Salvatore and Kemp said that when it came to this series, they already had a story in mind that they wanted to tell. And so when they found out they're going to be sundering, um, what they had to do is they had to modify this story so it could fit into this series. Did you already have, uh, like them, a, a story in mind that you wanted to tell and you were – you just had to modify it to stick it into uh, this. I did and I didn't. Uh, when I when they first started, they said they really wanted to see characters that were human or half elves. Uh, when you're talking about working, you know, between between the novels and the role playing, uh, more people play those races in the role playing games than any of the others. So the thought was, okay, well, th these are the characters people relate to. Um, Farida is a tiefling, uh, so the the concern was people can't relate to tieflings. So um, I was. Told I needed to make up a, a human wizard character. So I, I started working with that story and I had an idea, um, but they also wanted a story that could lead to more stories, to a whole series of books about this character. And I was coming up short and I was like, this book ends and I don't really have a strong feeling for what comes next. I, I feel like I'll be cheating this character. But by the way, I really want to go back. I want to finish my Brimstone Angels stories. Um, and I sat down and I, I told James Wyatt all of this. And he, you know, expressed his concern. Tieflings are weird. They're really weird. And my point was that it it kind of doesn't matter. What matters is, are the characters relatable? Because you can look at Forgotten Realms, and, and I don't think anybody can argue that the, the best-known Forgotten Realms character is Drit, who is a drow. And you cannot tell me that drow are not extraordinarily weird. But that's not why people love Drits. They love Drits because they can relate to... You know, his his experiences are sort of a version of their experiences, right? Being, you know, feeling like you don't belong or ex just not belonging and, and finding a, a family that you make for yourself. You know, this is something that people can really relate to. And I, I won him over. So I I got to take the story that I was working on and, and make it Rita's story. 
there are things that were set up in those previous books that then were carried forward and, and adapted to the Sundering. So I didn't have a book in mind, but but because, you know, you, you set up the promise of a story, you kind of have to follow through. You, you can't have the gun on the mantle and just throw it away in the second act. So there were things that I, I had to establish that I needed to, to make sure I, I talked about. Um, but a lot of it was, was made up specifically for the Sundering. So Kemp said his story was influenced by his wife being pregnant, having, you know, having kids and the, the fears and issues that go with there. Salvatore said his story is influenced because he wanted to end the Dredge story. It was supposed to be the very end of his, uh, of everything that he was doing. And so what influenced this story? Where did you draw from to create this story? One thing was that my, my grandfather-in-law passed away uh, the summer before we did the first story summit and um, I got a chance to read a letter that he had written to his grandson about the time he spent in the Santo Tomas internment camp in the Philippines when he was a teenager. His father was working for the U.S. military there and when the Japanese took the Philippines, they were taken and put into a, an internment camp. And so he, you know, he these, these were, these, the letter was kind of toned down for uh, the audience because he wrote this to his grandson when he was, I think, not nine or ten. Um, but, you know, a lot of it was, it struck me how much of, of it was just a teenager's life within these, these sort of um, traumatic uh, circumstances. And, and, and things like, you know, there were, there were things like trying to make sure he had enough food, going from being a really picky eater to being the kind of person that when I met him, you know, he, he would finish his plate and then finish yours and then eat the garnish because he was so, he had gone through that experience of going without um, and, and making sure that you used every scrap of everything. But also at the same time, you know, with his friends trying to figure out ways that they could throw like illicit dances so that they could see the girls and, and, and spend time with them and, and be teenagers. Um, and I just thought it was really fascinating glimpse of, of this experience and and of course my first thought is what would happen if you add a fantasy setting to this so that was sort of the the genesis of that first idea um you know it's hard to say what else because because i feel like everything that happens in a writer's life kind of filters in in some ways um i wrote adversary during um the first year year and a half of my my son's life. I actually he was born four days before that story summit, so I, I was there on conference on a conference call. I mean that's just a, a whole new experience of of stress and and um, ad adaptation. You know, figuring out okay, I am in over my head. What do I do next? And and I'm sure that filters in, even though it's a complete the book. I mean, there's no babies in the book. <laughs> it's a completely different experience. But um, yeah, I mean, I think I think all of that kind of comes into it. If you want babies, try reading Kemp's book. It's, it's just full of babies. <laughs> yeah, my baby's due in March, and that was kind of terrifying. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, my, my wife, I, I tried having her, her read it, and uh, as I say, your book was far less terrifying, and uh, she actually liked it. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so you already mentioned this a little bit, but authors tend to project pieces of themselves into their characters and stories. So what of yourself did you project into uh, this story and some of your characters? I think I think every character has a little piece of me in it, a little version or a little kind of imaginary, like what would I do in this situation? But then, I mean, I, I think to an extent every character needs to make sense to you, but then you need to keep taking it further. I know, like, the, the main character in the book, Farida, is a tw twin sister, um, and they have, you know, they have a close relationship that's full of lots of conflict at the same time. I have two sisters, and that was really a lot of the inspiration for their interactions through the series. That, especially, and I think it happens less in adversary because they definitely have something really big to argue about in adversary. But in previous previous books, where they are arguing and and it it look it seems like it's about one thing and. It's really it's really about something else, but actually it's about something lower. The the one that jumps to mind is Havilar being angry at Farida for for running off with um, Bryn at one point, being chased off by an owlbear actually, and getting getting lost, and, and her being mad at at Farida for that, and Farida being like, "How can you be mad at me for being attacked by a monster?" And then Havilar, you know, admits, "Well, it's not about that. It's about the fact that you ran off with this boy and you left me behind." And really, it's about Havilar's fear of being left alone and losing her identity because she loses her her sister as that piece to bounce off of. And and that that realization that you get eventually that this is how you argue with your siblings a lot of times. Like you're not what you're mad about is not what you're really mad about. Um, 
that was really beneficial to the, making the characters work. Yeah, I think I think there's there's just a little bit of different things in different ones. Doll is another character where he's he's sort of this very angry version of myself in college, where you know you go from being the smart kid in the high school to going to a you know college full of other smart people and not really knowing how that fits together anymore and and having I had a hard time um adjusting to it. And so Doll is a is a character who's he's very smart, but he's come from a kind of he I mean he's he's like a farmer's son from from the backwaters of the Dale Lands who goes and becomes a paladin of Ogma and his his uh fellow apprentices don't really think much of him and he becomes very prickly and angry about it. Um, so it's that taking that, that feeling that you have and expanding it into a whole identity, I think. I think that's how, you, how I do it anyway. That's a great answer. <laughs> Good. <laughs> One of the things I've noticed on your blog is people have asked you if your characters are based on, uh, on different archetypes. And you were saying that um, you know, they aren't actually based on an archetype. They're just, they're just based on – they're just a character. They're just that character. Did you purposely try to make uh, your characters not fit into certain archetypes? Or did it just happen? It's really, it's really the second one. I, I really love characters. I love making complex people with lots of flaws and lots of quirks and, um, you know, traits that you can really admire at the same time. I don't tend to go in and think, like, I need a gruff fighter or I need, you know, a femme fatale or something like that. That it's, it's more, I, I, you know, even when I start with a character who's kind of in the background and... They, you know, they, the more they start to interact with the other characters, the more they start to kind of get a shape. In Adversary, there's a character, Thara, who actually started out, she originally was a man named Tharvis, um, and he was, like, he wasn't fitting into the story right, and he wasn't working, and, and then I, I gave him some kind of additional help, and one of them was this woman, Stibora. Stibora I loved Stibora, but she was supposed to be like a Rashemi Harper. And at the time it was like, this didn't make any sense. So I kind of combined, ended up combining the two into Sara because they, they filled all the, the, the stuff I needed. Um, but I didn't go in going, I need, you know, I need something that fits the shape. I needed the story to kind of fill in around it and tell me what was missing. So I don't, yeah, I don't tend to go in with the, with that, sense ahead of time, which means I have to do a lot more work <laughs> than if I did. And I sometimes get into these weird conversations with marketing folks about what, what, uh, how, how do they sum up Farida in three words? Just say she is Farida. There are three words. Exactly. <laughs> so what was the most challenging aspect of uh, this particular foray into the Forgotten Realms for you and uh, and your characters? Oh, the scope of it, I think. Um, this book is, is longer than any of my other books. I think I... I would have been happy if it was even longer. Um, part of that is just making sure the whole story gets told and it feels epic in a way that the Sundering deserves. Part of that is making sure that all the other things that are happening are accounted for. Um, between the other novels, the the, um, the adventures that they're putting out, and then they also commissioned a um, sort of history of the Sundering as an internal document to keep track of what else is going on in other areas of the world and, and making sure that it, it felt grounded within all of that. But then also this book is meant to be an entry point uh, for, you know, Brimstone Angels is a larger series. I didn't want to write a book where if you hadn't ever heard of Brimstone Angels or Lesser Evils and you picked up the adversary that you'd start reading and be completely lost. So there's also the part, the aspect of trying to trying to get readers up to speed with who these characters are, how they interact with each other, what they've been through that's relevant to this book, um, and then you know, kind of what happened, what's happened to them in the in the past that that'll inform it. Um, which is it was a pretty daunting task. I, I worked really hard to make sure that that it wasn't really esoteric for people who haven't read my other books, but that hopefully you read it. And if you haven't read the previous two, you want to go back and read them. Well, so far, I have to say every single book in this series has got me to want to go back and read the other books by that author. And uh, your book is definitely, um, definitely one of those that makes you want to go back and read uh, your other books. Okay. <laughs> so your book is the only book in this series of Forgotten Else Mega Authors that's written by a female. What perspective do you feel that you were able to add um, 
to this collection uh being the only female author out of this uh in the series um i mean in general i think it, it's hard to say because it's you know what i bring is what i bring um what another woman would bring would be a different thing uh I am the only one with a female main character. I'm not the only one with a, with a female character. There are other, I mean, obviously like Okia and, um, uh, oh, what is her name? Umara is coming up in the Reaver. And, and so there are, there, I mean, there are other characters, but as far as those main core characters to get the cover, Farida's the only one. I, I don't know. I feel like for me, I try very hard to make all of my characters very well-rounded and, and really relatable. And it, it, it warms my heart in a strange way when I get comments from fans that say things like, you know, this is the first time I've read a book with uh, a teenage girl for a, a protagonist, and I'm really surprised at how much I liked it. I, I think sometimes we get the idea that the books that are about women or girls are for women or girls, and that they'll be off-putting for guys. I do have a, a, a good proportion of female fans, but I, the, if you, well, if my Facebook metrics are accurate, <laughs> most of my fans are men. Um, and I, I don't think that I think that, that writing a story that's that's something it doesn't really matter what gender you are you can relate to. Um, that's my goal. The, the make sure that there are women there and women in the realms who are, you know, doing justice to what the realms can do. That's my hope. It seems to me that one of one of your strengths is that you're able to bring in a lot more emotional resonance. Not that. Uh, you know, with Kemp and Salvatore, the books were full of emotional resonance and, you know, dia believable dialogue and so on. But while theirs are more focused on action and more fantastic elements, you have all these believable interactions and emotional interactions and how characters actually react and do things in this world is very, very, very believable. And uh, is this one of the, the strengths you focus on, like all these uh, interactions between people and how they talk and how people will actually, would actually respond? To and that, Yeah, that's something... That I really like writing about. I I've joked before. One time, James Wyatt, who is the, the story editor, um, asked me whether I felt like what I wrote was categorized as high fantasy or sword and sorcery. And I thought about it for a minute, and I said, you know, I would call it fantasy soap opera. The first time I met Ed Greenwood, he described the realms to me as he said the realms is about people, and I. I firmly believe that. And so for me, that comes through as you have these big, epic, crazy magic issues, but the people who are dealing with them have their own problems, right? They're, you know, it's just like, you know, you and me and, and everybody where we, we have some big thing to deal with, but we still have to, you know, have an argument with our spouse or um, have to call our moms or, you know, deal with the neighbor or whatever. All that stuff doesn't go away just because, you know, you're living in a world where magic is it actually it gets more interesting. If you go into a world where, you know, the gods are coming down and doing things and, and magic is real and, and you get to carry a sword everywhere, right? It, it just, it changes it, but not, it doesn't make it go away. While I realize it has been there for the, the previous two novels, I didn't really notice it until uh, this your novel, but there's a poem at the beginning of each book in the Sundering that basically spells out uh, the plot of the series. Was um, who wrote this, and then uh, w when was it created? Was it created at the uh, the very beginning to help you know teach everyone the direction to go, or how how was it created? That was created after. That was actually written by I believe it was written by James Wyatt um, after the first couple of story summits, and we had all sort of settled on what our what our books were, and um, he sent around each of the stanzas. Um, said like, you know, does this feel accurate? Is there anything that sort of could be better? Um, and then, you know, it came all came together. Um, I like it a lot for the fact that it, it adds that depth. It, it's kind of, that's something I love about the realms is that whatever happened, there's like 10,000 years of history behind it that you can go back and mine. Um, and so this ties it back to that, that first, um, you know, not the first century, but the, the previous one, right? So you began as an editor in the Forgotten Realms. How did you go from being an editor to being able to write in the Forgotten Realms, especially, um, you know, leading up to this story? And what sort of resources uh, do you utilize to uh, in, in your writing? I started out, so I started out as an editor. Um, while I was the Eberron line editor, and I was also a secondary editor for Forgotten Realms, which means that I, I picked up sort of the, the standalones, um, there were a couple of trilogies that I, I worked on, but but generally, you know, there was the line editor for Forgotten Realm because it's so big. She took most of it. Um, the managing editor had a couple. He was 
Bob Salvatore's editor and, and Paul Kemp's and, and such. Um, and then I would kind of take the new authors. Um, I got the opportunity because there was a series coming out called Ed Greenwood Presents Waterdeep. Um, and they were doing a limited call, which means they send the uh, requirements to a variety of authors and ask for an audition, a pitch. Uh, this is say, this is the story I want to write, and here's a little sample of what I would write. And then of those, they choose uh, the number of books they needed. In this case, they needed two. Uh, and they want you always want to make sure you're asking more author, authors than you need for a limited call. So if you you know get someone who says, oh, I can't do that, or you get a pitch that really doesn't fit, that you have another option because because that always happens, right? Um, so the editor, other editor, came around and she had seen some of my personal work. And she said, I think you'd be a good fit for this. Would you like to do it? Would you like to try out? Because I'm short. Um, and I said, sure, why not? Because I, I kind of had a little idea brewing. And I was like, actually, this would work really well in Waterdeep. Um, so I typed it up. And instead of being the extra person, it turned out they really liked it. So I got the opportunity to write The Godcatcher. And, you know, from there, I got I got to write Brimstone Angels and Lesser Evils and, and now The Adversary. I use a lot, a lot of source books and, and novels. Um, I have a bunch of my own, uh, and Wizards is also very good at um, getting me PDFs of things, or, um, you know, if I find out that, that there is a mention in another book of, uh, of, like, another novel of something, they'll sometimes cut the excerpt for me so I can check it. Um, there's a part of, of the adversary. It turned out that one of the locations, when I was first kind of planning it, one of the locations I was looking at, um, the location I ended up choosing has a, a feature that's been there, I think, since second edition, and it appeared in one of the transition novels. It was in the Lady Penitent series, and so I got, you know, she, the, the editor sent me the, um, the documents for the Lady Penitent series so I could search through and find it all, but then I could, you know, read it too, because it, it's fun, that, and, which is really helpful, because, when, I mean, when you're working in a shared world, it's good to be cognizant of all the things other authors have said about what you want to write about. If you just go in and write whatever you want, uh, frequently you're stepping on someone's toes. You're not, you know, necessarily doing the world justice. And when you have that opportunity, I feel like, you know, you have to take it. So does Wizards of the Coast help you a lot? Because I know when it comes to like Star Wars and other big franchises, it's really hard to write when there's, you know, games and books and so many other things involved in this series. Did you find it hard to write in such a big sandbox that uh, so many others are playing in? They, yeah, they do help a lot. I think part of it is making... So far, I've managed to pick areas where it's okay if I don't know everything. Um, with with for Waterdeep, for example, there was an entire Waterdeep Bible for the series. So, um, and then Ed Greenwood was one of the editors. So, you know, you you had you had he, he had your back. Um, he still has my back. I send him emails all the time. Like, what kind of flowers would grow here? If I put this in a garden, will it be green at this time of year? And he, you know, he has all these things either written down or just in his head. Um, he's amazing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the nice thing about, like, working in Waterdeep, for example, is it's such a big city that you can talk about one little part of it and it, it's, it's okay. And, and then the other part of it is I've only written in fourth edition. So a lot of things changed. A lot of things you know, the, there was room to sort of flesh out that particular spot and no one could say, well, no, 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 because so-and-so walked past that corner and there was definitely not an apothecary there, which is, you know, that that's, that's the problem or, or at least the challenge that you get into when you work in shared world is, is that eventually it creates so much detail that you can't just throw something down. You really have to make sure you, that it's, nobody else has said anything there. Um the nice thing, too, about that is that then you can look at those resources. You can go back and look at the older stuff and find what's been said and put it in and use it as an inspiration for, you know, what comes after. Neverwinter is a great example. I wrote Brimstone Angels is set in Neverwinter. And um, if you've read the Neverwinter saga or played the MMO, you know that they really they really went a little bit crazy up in Neverwinter. And and now it's, you know, it's a city that's rebuilding itself. So you have all these ruins, but those ruins were something once. Um, so being able to go in and, you know, kind of describe things um, based on what used to be there adds a layer of 
of detail that I think fans really appreciate. Having I had a character that I went back and I found a Neverwinter Nights character who this person could possibly be the descendant of, and and having that little Easter egg that you know for 99% of people it's not even going to register, but for that one percent they're going to go, oh wait, oh I know what you're talking about. Um, and that's fun. I think that's that's the nicest aspect of, of writing in the realms as it is, is that you have all of that to draw on and there's enough room to kind of create and there's an, but there's also that that's all that stuff, all that history to fall back on and, and use it to inspire you. So you said you basically you've just written in D and D four. Um, you know, since you're writing the transition to D and D five or D and D next, I believe it's called. Um, are you excited to be writing in the in the in the world of D and D next? I am. The the only trouble is that my um, I just turned in the first draft of my next book. It will still happen during the sundering, because uh, just because I, adversary happens in the middle of it, so then the next book is sort of the, the late middle to end of it, um, and. Th- and that's so it's like I'm not all the way into the new world yet. I'm still describing the changes as they happen. But I, I appreciate the fact that that's an option that they that they have that you can that the stories can unfold at their own pace and they're not saying, OK, well, jam it into 1488 because we got to get there eventually. It's, it's good that they, they they're caring about making sure that the stories do what they need to do to to be entertaining to, to readers. Well, that's exciting. So. So you started off as an editor. Did you purposely try to get that job because you were a fan of Forgotten Realms and fantasy and so on? Or was it uh, basically just a job for you? I have to admit, it was the job. This, and it, it really startled me when I started working there because I have always been a huge fantasy reader. I had I was pretty sure I'd read every single novel marked with a little fantasy sticker um, in my library at, when I was growing up. Um, but I... I Never read a Forgotten Realms novel. And I, I still don't know how that happened. Especially because once I started writing for them, I had all these friends from high school go, oh my god, you're writing Forgotten Realms books? I loved Forgotten Realms books. I'm like, where were you? Come on! But once I started, I, you know, when I first started, I didn't have a whole lot to do because you have to kind of wait for things to come in. So I read. I, I started out one of the first project assigned to me was, was they were doing recovers of the Sembia series. And so I sat down and I read the entire Sembia series. Um, Paul Kemp's Shadow's Witness is like the first Realms novel I read through and went, wow, oh my gosh. Um, I mean, he's a really amazing writer. Um, and then, I, you know, it was anything that they needed proofread because I could, I'm a pretty quick proofreader, so I'd get the galleys and I'd, so I'd be reading um, just tons and tons. And, and, you know, even especially that first year, I just tore through. Uh, I... I think it's really amazing. I, I, like you can go get a really good fantasy story from so many places. There are you know t- tons of classic fantasy stories, tons of really amazing writers working today. But the thing about the realms is when you read one of those stories, you get the sense that this world is persisting in a thousand different directions. It's it just has this resonance that that it's hard to find other places because it's managed to last for so long and and develop in so many directions. I, I think that's really wonderful. So, knowing that this is such a big universe, there's computer games, there's board games, there's you know card games, there's tons and tons of novels. What was it like to? step into this universe was it scary what, what was your feelings when you first started uh getting into this massive massive shared world a little daunting um I, I mean at first i don't think i appreciated the scope of it until i really started working and it was like oh my god like the i i was the they put me in charge of the samples library so i made a giant spreadsheet of all the all the novels that we we had and while the, the you know there's a handful where someone's borrowed in, we didn't have any more, and we needed to track one down. And it, I mean, it's I don't remember the numbers anymore, but that's that spreadsheet is gigantic. It's I mean, it's really astounding, and that doesn't include you know I wasn't keeping track of source books or or articles or game video games. Um, it's I mean when you think about it, this this world is is just astonishing. There's not really anything else like it. So um, a lot of our listeners are writers, so we just want to learn to write. So what sort of, since you've you know, gotten this yourself, what sort of advice would you give to people who want to A, write, and B, uh, write in Forgotten Realms and get into um, this type of world, this type of setting? Uh, what type of advice would you give to uh, you know young up-and-coming writers, whether they want to be a professional or not? The one thing I see a lot of beginning writers do that hurts them 
um, is that you, you if you're right, especially if you're writing fantasy or science fiction, there still needs to be something true about that story. Um, the magic's cool, the wizards are cool, the, the fighting and the dragons, all this stuff is really cool, but what makes a reader engage, what makes a, a, an agent pick it up, um, there has to be something about that story that's true, that you're clearly passionate about. Um, you kind of have to dig down and find something in you and add that to the story, or it's going to be flat. It's never going to come together. Keep writing. I think that's the one everybody says, but it's it's sort of the advice that if I could go back in time and tell my, my baby writer self, like, no, seriously, just keep going. You're going to write some terrible stuff, but if you don't get that out, you won't get to the really amazing stuff that's, in you know, down in there. And I'd also say, you know, along with that, Keep reading and and read everything and and try to hang on to that joy of reading when you're when you're writing and, and as your craft is developing you know you've got your create creative faculties and you've got your critical faculties and you need them both but when those critical faculties get too high you can start to look at things and and hate everything you read and the best thing for that is to just keep going uh, because that's a sign you're gonna get be- you're gonna get better soon right you're 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 ready for a big jump. <laughs> But if you stop and you stop reading and you stop writing because everything's terrible, you'll never, it won't happen. So the last question we like to ask all of our guests um, is we give them a soapbox so that they can uh, promote any upcoming appearances, any upcoming sales. Like you have the this book, um, The Adversary and the Sundering. So uh, we're going to give you the soapbox to promote or say whatever you'd like to the fans. My book, The Adversary, comes out December 3rd. Um, it is available for pre-order at all fine booksellers. Uh, it's also available if you would like a signed copy. Uh, my website, slushlush.com, S-L-U-S-H-L-U-S-H.com, has a link for an e-signing. Uh, you can order a signed copy from me. I will also point out I recently played in a charity game for the Extra Life charity, and our team, our Wizards of D&D team, um, we raised over $21,000 which means there will be a follow-up event on December 7th. If you guys if you missed it, if you missed watching me play as Havilar with my with my big crazy horns, um, you can catch it again on uh, Twitch TV, and we are still collecting donations for that. So um, the address for that is also on my website. So if you're interested in helping out the Children's Miracle Network and supporting Extra Life, the gaming charity, that's a, a great place to check out. Well, thank you very much for being on the show. This was uh, actually a whole lot of fun, and uh, I'm quite sure our listeners are going to go check out uh, The Adversary and some of your other books because this has been this has been great. <laughs> I had a lot of fun. Let's hope it uh, gets to the the top of the sales chart, kind of like a, like what Kemp wanted when it, when his book was released. <laughs> Here's hoping. I'm 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 so nervous. December doesn't tend to be a month people buy a lot of books, but I think this is, this event is is kind of getting a lot of traction. So it's a. Uh... And now we get to see how this series progresses all the way through the the last book done by the founder Ed Greenwood himself. It's a little nerve wracking. <laughs> <laughs> so you know it's gonna be a wild ride i'm really excited to read that one too so thank you very much and uh we'll send this too soon as it's up have a fantastic day and best of luck wonderful thank you 